afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, let's get started. Um, I just sent an announcement about the lecture on the next Wednesday, uh, where I ask you um, for ideas of what to do. Um, so yeah, if you could fill out that survey, that'd be great. Um, I can of course decide what on the topic and either whether we'll have a lecture or are you going to work on projects, but I would really love to hear what you would like to talk about in that session. So yeah, please, please fill out that uh, survey. Are there any questions about projects or anything else related to the logistics of this course or the content that we had before? Yeah. Uh, when we have the final uh, exam or quiz, we won't have, we won't do anything. You know, we I, I won't teach you anything else on that day. Okay. And basically, today's lecture is the last lecture in terms of the content. Uh, unless we collectively decide that next Wednesday we'll do something else, but I, I doubt that whatever we'll do uh, next Wednesday, I will include in the exam. Um, so yeah, basically whatever we have done so far, including today's lecture, would be on exam. An exam itself will be more like a quiz, just to test your most basic, um, you know, understanding of the concept in the course uh, and evaluation, like how how how. For me, it's important that you end this course knowing if I tell you these are highlights that you can imagine what kind of explanation that is and what kind of evaluation measure you would use to evaluate it in the past and today. That's basically what the quiz will be about. Very, very basic. Yeah. Can you repeat the second part? What would be the duration and format of the program? Are we expected to do mathematical calculation for this question? There will be no math derivations. Uh, it will be, uh, as I just said, basic understanding of the concepts uh, that we have covered in the course, explanation type, different explanation types, mm -hmm. and uh, the way that each of these types is evaluated in the past. And um, I will ask you a little bit on these uh, application grounded evaluations. So most basic uh, stuff we have talked about uh, in the course, and we will have a lecture where I will go give you an overview. I, in none of the classes I teach, I deem that overview lecture as a way to prepare for the quiz or exams. So there might be questions that are outside of it, but more or less what we talk about in the Overview lecture is the ground for the exam as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not decided yet. I think I will do, um, I, I didn't write the exam, so I don't know. I can't tell you what's in the exam that doesn't exist, but um, I think I will try to uh, give you terms and you will need to connect it with examples and uh, potentially with the names of evaluation measurements before, but I also do need to see whether that um, is not too trivial, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I feel like with elimination, you can also get quite far. So um, yeah, I still need to think about the, um, about the um, actual exam. But I, yeah, I would personally also prefer if it's multiple choice. So um, yeah, it is going to be something simple. I just wanted for all of you to finish the course with, you know, that you know what sufficiency is or comprehensiveness as an evaluation that that's not like, oh, I have heard it in this course, but I completely forgot what it is. Yeah. Um, Okay, we'll talk more about the exam when the time comes. I will also see whether ideally, uh, I would like it also to be something we just uh, meet here and you all have, do it on your laptops on Canvas. I'll look into that. So that also speaks for how uncomplicated uh, it will likely be. Okay, um, 
let's let's move on then with the uh, with the lecture. So when I talked about trust in AI, we started with the definitions about uh, of interpersonal uh, no, excuse me interpersonal trust. So trust between pe uh, people themselves. So that came from the psychology, sociology, and other fields in social sciences. And today we are also going to do something similar. We are going to talk about the conversational framework of explainability, which also kind of stems for our own way how people explain each, uh, between each other. And then when we engage with AI systems, we also expect that kind of um, engagement with them. We want explanations from the systems and we still deem them as people and want to have a conversation uh, with them. Um, so we are going to look into uh, the insights we have from psychology. We are going to then turn that into insights that can be used to build uh, algorithms. Namely, we are going to see how we can have a conversational uh, system for providing all those different kinds of explanations we talked about in the first part of the uh, course. And then, of course, when we do user studies, application grounded evaluations with actual human subjects, we do need to go back to people and think about uh, about uh, psychology of people. And this is very simplistic view of what human-centered computing is. Uh, but I do think that these topics that we are talking about uh, in these recent lectures are more human-centered uh, relative to the topics we talked about in the first part of the course, which were more purely driven by perspective of machine learning uh, researchers. Okay, so um, let's start with those perspectives from psychologists, psychology. Um, here I have a snippet from a wonderful paper by uh, Hinton from uh, 90s, where he discussed how people uh, explain between each other. So this is still about human to human uh, ways of explaining. And he says causal explanation. By causal explanation, he means types of explanations we have talked about in the first part of the course. Something where you point to causes for us, for the model prediction um, in real world amongst each other, it's anything, any event we want to explain. So causal explanation, you can just think about it as an explanation the way we talked about it in this course. He says it's a first and foremost, a form of social interaction, which is very different view of what explanation is than in machine learning, right? We didn't talk about social interaction. We, you know, we talked about it in a very different ways. He says one speaks of giving causal explanations, but not attribution, perceptions, comprehensions, categorizations, or memories. The verb to explain is a three place predicate. Someone explains something to someone. Causal explanation takes the form of conversation that is thus subject to the rules of conversation. So this is a very, very different uh, framework of, uh, of uh, explainability. And Tim Miller in 2019 has published this paper that I keep mentioning on uh, insights from social sciences that can be brought into explainable AI. It's a, it's a wonderful paper that I read it at the beginning of my postdoc and then it kind of sets the whole trajectory for it. Um, it's re And I heard from other people that it really was kind of pivotal moment for them too. Um, and he also says, um, you know, reporting on the Hinton's work that when we talk about the attributions, uh, these are just a presentation of association and uh, causes. Uh, and we extract the causal chain and display it to a person. And this is very different from what the conversation actually is, where you engage with another person. Um, and he proposes, he presents also these two stages of explainability that I think are really useful that kind of frame kinds of explanations we talked about in the first part of the course versus um, what we are going to talk about now. And the first stage is so-called diagnosis of causality, where explaining explainer determines why an action or event occurred. Um, let me skip through this. So for us explainer, for Hinton, because he studies just people, for him explainer is a human. For us, explainer is an explainability method we use to explain a model's prediction, right? So in real world, we would explain some actual events uh, that we are all aware of, uh, but here we are explaining a model prediction. So 
techniques we have used in the first part of the co uh, course are basically techniques for diagnosis of causality. Although um, word causality is way stronger than what our explainability methods, the ones we covered actually do, right? We have talked a lot about faithfulness and how there are no faithfulness guarantees. If our explainability methods were truly causal, then we would know that the explanation is faithful to the model's prediction. So yeah, I'm borrowing this term from Hinton, but this is, um, I don't know what would be a better term here, but diagnosis of something like causality, but not really causality would be appropriate. So that's, that's what we covered in length. And now the second stage is explanation presentation, which is a social process of conveying this to someone, which is very different, right? Uh, and this very much depends on the person we are conveying this information to. Um, in your conversations with different people, you tailor the same information such that if that information comes across better, if you are talking to a high schooler about AI, if you're talking to your parents about AI or to your peers in this room, you use completely different language, although you might be explaining exactly the same thing. And he says the problem is then, after these two stages, to resolve a puzzle in the explaining mind about why the event happened by closing a gap in their knowledge. Um, so translating this to ex uh, explainability method and AI's prediction, we are providing explanation of model behavior such that we close a gap about uh, in someone's uh, knowledge about that uh, model. So this whole framework and the reason why I'm translating in these terms like explainability method uh, models prediction is to show you that, again, we can map the human-human interaction into human-to-AI interaction. Here previously I said that uh, if explanations takes the form of conversation, then it's subject to rules of conversations. Um, when I say rules of conversation, does uh, anything comes to mind? That's right. I'm looking at you because I know you know a little bit more about linguistics. <laughs> and uh, this, if you have taken an NLP course or any other linguistics course, um, you have probably heard about the Grice's maxims, the proposed by the uh, linguist Paul Grice, uh, which are rules of cooperative conversations. And uh, there are, I believe, four of them. First of them is about quality, which says that you should not say things you believe to be false or say things for which you do not have sufficient evidence. So for example, we now know that GPT-4 doesn't follow this quality rule because it does hallucinate and mentions informations that are uh, false or that the model has no sufficient and sufficient evidence for. And we have seen now in the last paper we all discussed here that we use chat GPT to verify information and use its own explanations to see whether a person can better rely on this uh, prediction of veracity of whatever information we are checking. So we know that at least one type of explanation, namely free form explanations coming from chat GPT do not follow this uh, maxim. Have a maximum of quantity, uh, make your contributions as informative as it's required and do not make it more informative that is required. Um, which also goes uh, together to the argument I was mentioning when I was presenting uh, contrastive explanations where I said um, for a while, you know, in machine learning, we wanted to present every single reason for the prediction but person actually does not want to hear every single cause in the causal chain, but rather the difference uh, between two options. So not necessarily everything in the causal chain is needed to convey the information. Uh, we have a maximum of relation, be relevant, only totally provide uh, information that's related to conversation. Um, I don't know, have you noticed this when we when you did your second assignment, when I would ask you to prompt Lama and um, IDEFIX to um, generate explanations, but what I noticed when I played around with any model for 
this task is that it will mention some information that are kind of related to the uh, punchline, but then kind of misses the punchline. Or even if it mentions the why something is really funny, mentions all of these extra things that you are like, come on, come to the point. Like we don't need this all this extra uh, fluff. And um, yeah, I think this is still still a big issue for a lot of language models. And finally, manner, uh, avoid any obscurity, ambiguity, be brief, be orderly, uh, and so on. And in hint on in the in the paper, which uh, touches on the explanations between people, says that explanations should follow the same uh, same maxims. So when I said before that uh, the explanation uh, is a conversation and that the rules of conversation should be followed here. Uh, so they are subject to the rules of conversation. These are the rules that uh, should be uh, followed. Uh, any questions about this? Yeah, uh, I really like these rice maxims. If you want to read now what this ancient history, I guess, 2018 paper, uh, there is a paper on text generation where they introduce um, classifiers such that the generation of text is um, such that the generations are encouraged to accord to all of these um, maxims. I don't know whether the paper itself is still relevant uh, in terms of whether we need a technique like that for GPT-4, uh, but I think it's a really neat uh, work in case you, if you wanna read it, I can provide you a reference. So this, these Grice maxims pop out in uh, NLP quite often. And um, if we want to also maybe think about where these maxims apply in that categorization of the diagnosis of causality versus here, uh, diagnosis of causality versus uh, explanation presentation, then I think that the quality and quantity are more related to, uh, to the first part, to the first stage where we are worried about logical characterization of explanations and uh, the relation and manner are in my mind more related to how uh, explanation should be given. Okay, so if you want to kind of um, summarize these four rules, they say only say what you believe, only say as much as is necessary and only say what is relevant and say it in a nice way. And uh, Miller says that um, when we are having these conversations with the goal to explain something, what is important is to know uh, that there is a shared knowledge between the explainer and the explainee. So when I'm now explaining to you, I have a history of all of our prior lectures in mind. So I know that that's shared amongst us. And I don't need to necessarily go in details of explaining it now what an AI model is, because I know you know that. So shared knowledge, knowledge are presuppositions of the explanations. And other factors are the causes that should be explained. So what I said before, you don't, you are explaining only as much as is necessary. This should be taken into account. What is shared between, uh, between uh, us when one of us explaining something to each other. And when we are building an explainability method with the goal that a person has a better understanding, uh, we should also be assuming what their uh, knowledge about the whole situation uh, is. Something that none of the methods we have covered actually considered, right? This is, this is something that um, we will see a technical approach to address this, uh, but this is a really new area of research. And of course, now that ChatGPT exists, all of this sounds more feasible uh, than when I was presenting this last year when ChatGPT wasn't released, right? Now you might have ideas of how to get free text explanations, but also provide in your prompt, hey, listen, I am a graduate student and I already know about AI, so have that in mind when you explain these things. But then again, um, think about all the other types of explanations we covered that are not free text explanations how you would prompt GPT-4 to give you any other type of explanations considering your knowledge about, uh, technical knowledge about uh, AI. Um, I don't think you can really imagine how you would do that because I think it's really um, unclear uh, how, how, uh, how to do it. 
In any case, uh, when you choose which factors to present to a person, you are doing what Miller is saying, calling epistemic explanation uh, selection. So this is a technical term. If you encounter in something where you can know where that means. And uh, as I said just, just now, um, tailoring explanations to expectations of what the hearer knows uh, is completely ignored in uh, most of the explainability work. So for example, a, remember the case where we had a clinical note and then the model made a diagnosis about it. Um, for example, it decided that the person should not be admitted to a hospital. Let's imagine this person was in a emergency room. And here we are again, completely ignoring the variety of people who might be given this information. Um, so for example, if you are explaining anything about the medical diagnosis to a person who is uh, themselves a, a clinician at University of Utah Health, you would use completely different language than if it's a teenager who just wonders what's going on with them. Um, again, none of this is really, really considered. Uh, just, just make a mental tour of the, all the stuff we talked about before the fall break. We have never tailored explanation for anything. It was always one turn general explanation for that particular instance. So a good explanation must be relevant both to the question, of course, if we are asking why this happened, uh, it needs to be tailored to that, but also to the mental mode of the explanation is the, is the point that the Miller is uh, making. Uh, and there is so much more on this. I really recommend reading this paper. I mentioned it a few times. Again, today I uh, praised it again. Uh, it's a long one. At times it's a little bit dense and you are completely lost in, ter in terminology, but it's the one you come back to like, and you read like section by section and there are month passes in between. Okay, uh, but I wanna move on. So um, as I said, we, we have now some insights about how people explain between each other. And we want to bring that into our modeling approaches. And, uh, a paper from Lakarayu et al. had a go about investigating whether people actually really want this conversation. So they, they basically check whether taking these insights we have just talked about from psychology and bringing them into our algorithms, is this something true that something that people truly want? And this is the human-centered approach uh, to, to the system we are eventually going to talk about in this uh, lecture. So what they did is they had this uh, half an hour interviews with practitioners who use explainability uh, methods, 14 doctors and 12 policymakers. And they did this formative uh, research study where they just have these semi-structured interviews with them. And uh, the medical doctors were working on a diagnosis of uh, diseases with uh, an AI system. Uh, specifically uh, for diabetes um, from, oh, sorry, no, there are multiple things that they were diagnosing from diabetes to rare cancers, and policymakers were working on financial decision-making, such as loan approvals. Uh, neither of these are what we think uh, are NLP models. So input is not unstructured text. These are feature-based systems where features are manually designed, interpret interpretable features like the level of glucose or are you pregnant or not and stuff like that. So much easier, I would say, um, tasks to explain because you can go back and point to something that people can actually think about rather than, ah, dimension 11 in your 700 dimensional vector was really important, but we have no idea what that dimension means. In that sense, easier. And they asked them these questions. What do you like about model explanations they were giving? What do you dislike? What other features should you have? Uh, do you prefer that you got just a single shot explanation or interactive dialogue style and, uh, and so on? And, um, 16 out of 20 of six of them uh, said that they enjoy getting some understanding of deep learning models, that they like seeing which features contribute positively or negatively or seeing the essential features and so on. 
Um, so in general, there were some positive signs on giving them explanations together with the uh, predictions. And of course, there were some uh, negative uh, things uh, that they did not like. Um, so there were almost all of them, only with one person is expect ex exception. They were dissatisfied that the conversations were not possible. So this really confirms that truly in um, for people who are engaging with AI systems to do something, um, to take make some actions with them, they really want those conversation style explanation methods, similar to how they would, you know, um, explain this to another person, or if they ask another person, the the way that the person would respond to them. They didn't like that they cannot follow up on explanations. And this is so easy to imagine, you know, when you get that contrastive explanation and you're like, oh, let me change one more. Uh, no, I can't do it. Like, it's like just one thing. Um, they could not ask custom questions and, and so on. So again, with the chat GPT, this becomes uh, more and more possible to kind of ask custom questions and so on, but still think about um, the fact that you don't have access to internals of these chatbots and what do you do with them? Okay, and the amongst things they want to see improved, obviously if they were dissatisfied, there were no um, possibility to have a conversation to get the explanation they want to see that feature implemented. They wanted to have uh, reliable accuracy measurements uh, they wanted to have ability to ask custom questions. And uh, this is also interesting. They wanted to have ability to improve subgroup level questions, uh, explanations. Um, and if you remember when we would talk about influence functions, one of the roles, I believe it was the um, archeologist role. Uh, they showed us this paper where they uh, presented how influence functions can be uh, extended to removing a group of um, uh, examples rather than just one example and seeing how that affects the performance. So um, I think there is already a little bit of this out there in terms of technical proposals, but uh, as we all know, this is not something you now have implemented in any of the libraries you have engaged uh, with so far. Okay, um, so basically this just repeats the findings. And um, in this paper, then they said, uh, set these principles for how these interactive explanations uh, should uh, look like. They say they should uh, understand continuous requests for explanations and be uh, able to efficiently map these to appropriate explanations to run. Uh, so what does this second part mean is, for example, if I ask um, why, uh, why did the model predict this uh, explanation? Now, you taking this course, you know that there are many ways to go about answering this question technically. You can show them highlights, you can show them influential examples, you can show them uh, free text explanation. Um, so deciding what kind of explanation would be the most appropriate uh, is something to figure out in this interaction. And I don't think there any of these is better than others a priori, so reasonable novel uh, responses hey, I have multiple op options. Would you like to see this one or that one? And then a person might pick one of them and then um, they might have other questions uh, uh, about them. Um, they also say that the system should provide reliable notions of confidence along uh, with explanations. And I think this is what I try to emphasize multiple times through the course. Confidence, calibrated confidence is a great baseline for people who need explanations together with model predictions. And whatever we are giving them, it has to complement those confidence scores. And that's what people in the study had confirmed yet again. Um, these other things are very interesting. They also want to um, reduce or eliminate the need to write any code. Um, and again, with ChatGPT, I think this is easier to imagine. Um, Right now, we don't need to really train the models for every single task we wish um, a model does. We ask a bunch of questions and we get these responses. Um, so now if we can also have some kind of explainability component next to that, that would be 
uh, really nice, I think, uh, to people. Imagine in medical domain, ChatGPT can answer a lot of questions like what is glucose or how is glucose related to insulin or stuff like that. And if you are making um, predictions about diabetes, um, you do need to have a system that's that have seen cases of people who have diabetes or not. So it's hard for me to imagine that you can just put a new case or descriptions of um, um, of whatever you know factors that relate to diabetes and that the ChatGPT will just give you a good prediction. Although I might be wrong, I haven't tried this. I think you do need to have an actual model that's trained for it. But then you can imagine, even if you have a model trained for um, fine-tuned for um, making these predictions, it can still be the model that has been also designed for these general purpose activities. For example, LAMA2, you both have the ability to fine-tune it, but it still has some abilities to answer the questions like, what is glucose uh, and so on. So now if you have a system that is wrapped around LAMA2 for making uh, diabetes, diabetes predictions and can answer all of these questions related to it, we can also add all these explanations um, in this whole system. Then the question becomes, if I ask questions related to explainability, how do I call in my code actual function that runs the explainability methods, gets the output, and puts it into, into something that we can then present to uh, a user. And that's what we are going to uh, talk about. Okay, uh, let me see what else I have here. Um, in this paper, they also emphasize um, technical challenges that, um, that uh, will come out if you try to build something like this. Uh, this more or less talks about what I just have said. Um, so uh, to go in a little bit more detail about types of question a person may ask to, to a system to get an explanation might be, why does a, um, um, excuse me. Oh no, I didn't want to say that. Let me just try to find slide where I'm talking about. Oh, I don't have it. Excuse me. Okay, actually that was it. So a person could ask all of these uh, all of these questions. Why does a model make predictions across the entire domain for groups of instances or individual instances? Does the model learn intuitive rules for prediction or something more complicated? What parts of the model are most important for predictions? What data is most useful for learning and so on? And this all of this has to be answered for this, you know different domains from health healthcare, to policy making, and in different domains, you might have, um, you know, domain specific questions like the ones I mentioned, what is glucose or so on. So, the fact that these questions can be so different causes um, technical challenges for us to kind of parse them then into something that enables us to call appropriate uh, explainability method. So, I think. If I'm going over all of these frameworks, but I think um, it will be easier to understand all of these challenges if we actually go over one of these methods. And one of these methods is produced by the same people, it's called talk to model. Okay, so this is an overview of talk to model. It has um, a question, for example, applicant number 358 wants to know why they were denied the loan. Could you tell? Then the system needs to parse. Uh, this is to something they can uh, execute. Um, for example, you can imagine that this is a, just a call to different functions such as filter applic applicant 358 and then run uh, feature importance for that slice of data that you get when you filter the data such that you get only data points related to this person. And once you do that, you are going to get some outputs and you then need to present that output as a response, such as uh, they were denied because of their income and credit score, where feature importance here had found that income and credit scores were important features for this uh, specific prediction. Okay, we'll go into details of this. This is just a high level picture. 
the first part we need to do is to, given this variety of these utterances here, such as, um, could you tell me why they were denied a loan? And what could they do to change this? You need to parse this into something that you can then actually call from the command line. And what they did in this paper is they developed a grammar to, um, to represent what they think are all functions that are needed in this interaction. So you probably don't see this well. Is it too small? No, that's good. Okay, great. So here we have a first uh, set of operations that relate to data, such as um, filter your whole data set by some feature, its value, and a potentially comparison. So in the previous example where we have the uh, applicant number something, it here would feature would be applicant name, let's say, or applicant ID, and the value would be the value of that ID. Uh, you can change something in the data, you can um, look into the data and so on. And I think that in the paper, they say that it's important that people not only get these um, explanations of the type we have learned in the course, but also to have the ability to inspect the data because these things go hand in hand. Um, when you are developing the model, you as well very often go and just examine the data to see what's going on. Then we have other explainability methods. We have, um, First, uh, uh, feature importance. So here, because features are manually designed, they are interpretable, human interpretable. Here, you would just ret uh, return which one of them are important, and then it's just a list of words that actually mean something. Um, they have also implemented contrafactual explanations and so on. Um, here, you have uh, these operations that uh, enable you to go back into the conversation, something that they emphasize in that uh, categorization, which honestly right now, since we are already have chatbots that works to some extent, I don't think we really need this, uh, these uh, operations to that go back into, into the conversation. Okay, so to have something like this, you first need to construct the grammar yourself for your data and your model. So here they had a specific specific problem at hand, at hand, either loan approval or diabetes prediction. And for those specific problems, they were they sat down and collectively were thinking, what are the operations we need in this um, potential engagement uh, through conversations with people who are interested in these predictions? So they sat down and they decided these are these are the set of operations that are comprehensive and not too specific for the problems that can probably be applied to others as well. Um, okay, I said all this. Um, of course, difficulty is if you get a whole other, they, they try to be general and they try to be comprehensive, but um, if you have a whole new data set and whole other problem, this not might not work. Uh, this grammar that we have set might not work uh, there. Although I think when I just look at it, it's pretty, it's not overly specialized. So I, I don't deem this to be a huge problem, but now if you, let's say for your project, you decided, oh, I wanna try this as well, you might need to revisit something like this. Um, I don't know what that's to mean. Um, all right, so how do we go from, um, let me see the example before. Here we have applicant number something who wants to know why they were denied the loan. Could you tell me? Now what we need to do is translate this into these logical operations, which are, um, I don't have them on the slide here, but it would be, you would first have data filter, let's go, let's say, is it filter or just filter? You will filter data set, um, applicant name, value was 358. Okay, so that would be, that would give you a slice of data that has just this uh, person. And then you need to uh, explain this particular 
uh, instant. Oh, sorry. I think it is in the diagram. Oh, it is. Yeah. Should have only the four. I feel like the purple ones on there. These ones. Yeah, that's right. So these are um, these are the operations that need to be called. Uh, I'm trying to write them in actual, you know, like Pythonic way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you are completely right that here are the basically the name of names of the functions we need to need to call, and they are also put in the in the order that we would call them. In a more like Pythonic way, this exact same thing would look like um, explain brackets, filter, uh, output of the filter function that gives us the uh, corresponding data point. So this would be, let's say, uh, explanation. And if we had feature importance as our explainability method, then the explanation here would be a list of uh, important features. For example, uh, it could be, if you go back here, uh, bu, 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 it says uh, income and credit score. So explanation is actually here. I should have opened my <laughs> editor. Uh, income and credit score. And the reason why I showed you this example is because I wanted to uh, to tell you that the first step we need to do is given that free form utterance, we need to turn it into this composition of functions. That once we have that composition of functions, we actually call it in our terminal, we get the output, which here is a list of the features. And now the next step is to also produce a sentence that's more like a response from this list of features that says, they were denying the loan because of their income and credit score, which will be the next step. But right now we want to understand better how they went from the free form utterance into this composition of functions. Um, so what they did, and today this might be done in a simpler way with you know methods like um, uh, Lama Toon. Uh, but what they did is they first composed 687 utterance parse templates. Uh, by parse, I mean this composition of functions. So they literally wrote down many possibilities for going from utterance into the um, parse and um, made it in a more like a, like a template such that they can fill uh, different parts of the utterances and then get many of these pairs from these 600 something C templates. Does this make sense? Okay, so they get the 20 to 40,000 of these pairs. And what they do when we have these pairs is uh, just train uh, a model. At the time, they use the best model they have, which was GPTJ. Um, and they also kind of wanted to do in context learning with it. So they did something special. Um, and they also fine tuned T5. Um, I think they only went to the large version of T5, which kind of spe speaks for the state of the art at the time. Although the 3 billion, 11 billion was available, I think it wasn't really a thing we were doing when we wanted to just fine tune models. And they showed that fine tuning T5 gave them the best performance. And I don't think it's really important. I think these days it would just, um, you could of course uh, fine tune Llama 2, let's say, you would use the one with 7 billion because you can fit it on your CHPC GPUs, but you, maybe even uh, providing a few examples to Llama 2 would already give you good parses. Um, I don't know, I don't think anyone had really tried it. They also did the constraint decoding uh, to be within this grammar. So they didn't want um, our large language models can, as we know, have the power to just produce synonyms and be more creative. And in this case, we don't really want that. We want the language models to stick with the grammar because uh, if now they change uh, change the function uh, explain into justify and your justify function doesn't exist in your Python code, then you will get an error that it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, 
They also needed some data for testing here. They produced a little bit of more careful test set and that that served as a, as a way to evaluate and you know come to the conclusion that T5 uh, is better. Uh, as you can see here in the bolded results, uh, this German compass diabetes relate to a different uh, task. Um, I think that the compass is the loan approval. I honestly don't remember what uh, German uh, is. Um, and you can see here that performance is high, but not super high. And they were like, fine, it's fine with us to, to have uh, this level of, uh, of performance. Okay, so now we have a component that translates the utterances into parses. Um, now you need to actually execute them. So what do you use if you have explain function? Here they select the most uh, faithful under their given metric of faithfulness uh, as the uh, as the explanation. So as I, as I said before, you have multiple options. So what an explanation could be here. They run multiple of these options. They measure which one of them is the most faithful. And then they say, okay, probably this one is the most uh, you know um, informative to the person. So let's show them that one. Um, and as a faithfulness measure, they use uh, the sensitivity of the model of corruption of important uh, features without retraining. So this is basically similar to sufficiency where we remove important tokens and see the drop in performance, but we do know that that also could be caused by the out of domain um, uh, issue. If we have produced corrupted inputs that have not be part of the uh, training data, that could be the reason why the performance drops, not because these are really important. Uh, because they work with the uh, with the with these manually designed features, not with you know, unstructured text that we have talked about when I when we covered contrastive explanations. They use another method called dice, not mice, that we talked about. And um, they also have um, a way to show feature interaction effects. Um, remember, this was um, when we talked about this, we talked about attention-based uh, visualizations as the way to show feature interactions. Again, because they work with the whole different uh, inputs, they have different technique there. They also allow exploring data predictions. And the point here they also wanna make is that more can be added, right, in this grammar. Grammar can be adjusted depending on what you deem is important for your tasks and models. Okay, so, you get the, you have the utterance, you generate the parse, you execute the parse, parse returns the output, but you are pretending you are having a conversation. So instead of showing people a list of important features, you want to say something like, oh, they were denied because income and uh, whatever else. So what they did is given those outputs we get from the parses, they uh, again, manually designed some templates and then they fill in uh, these templates with the relevant information. So if you look here, um, here you, you see that these have, um, they're very structured, right? Everything that's in bold is what they will actually, which is this example specific. So here the utterance is, I want to learn more about patient 378. Please tell me the model's prediction and why it occurred. And then the answer from this system is the instance with ID equal to 378 is predicted to have diabetes. So here we put this information that's in bold specific to this instance that come from our functions. From this uh, prediction, glucose is the most important feature and has a positive influence. BMI is the second most important feature and has a positive influence and so on. So you can see it is pretty um, you know, structured. Um, and everything that's in bold is what we have placed in this uh, template for this instance. Um, this is a slight limitation of this work. It is a little bit, you know, it doesn't really have a, at some point maybe loses a little bit of flavor of conversation because um, here you could be a little bit briefer, right? You don't need to really uh, repeat uh, every single one of this is the most important, is the second most important feature and so on. Um, but it, it is a way to kind of make a response more conversational than just providing a list of features. And for a composition of multiple operations, they use uh, multiple templates are, are combined together. 
And uh, the reason why they decided on the templated approach versus generating uh, responses is because they deem that this approach won't uh, hallucinate uh, useless information. It won't now change BMI to something completely different that's not even in the feature space. Um, that said, I'm not convinced this is truly a big issue, and especially if you're fine tuning the model to be constrained uh, to this domain. Um, okay. Yeah, they say that responses won't be repetitive. I, I don't know whether that's really, really the case. Um, okay, they had a demo for a while. I tried it out today and it's broken, but if you reach out to Dylan, he's usually responsive and very like, whoops, and here is the working version. Um, so at some point there, there was a way to engage with this uh, thing, which was uh, really nice. Okay, so I said, we have these insights from people saying, listen, we want to converse with models um, to, to get why the model is doing things it's doing. We have found a way to integrate all of that into a system. And now we want to go back and see how people like it. We want to see uh, what's the outcome of our user study. Uh, I do want to go back and maybe just oops, talk a little bit about this whole setup and what are the you know, uh, how we can integrate it into current uh, models. Okay, so let's let's take ChatGPT as an example. Issue with using ChatGPT here is that we don't have access to GPT's internals, right? So I think we could say to G GPT-4, listen, this is our grammar, and here is an utterance, and it will be able to produce this parse. Uh, but then we can't execute this parse on GPT-4. We can execute it on another model that we have eternals for, right? Because what's happening in this stage is we are just calling our functions in our code and getting the outputs out of them. So here you could be only, you know, filtering the data with GPT-4 or producing free text explanations, but you wouldn't be able to, to uh, you know, get gradient-based highlights and so on. With Llama 2, with other open source models, you can um, you can do that. One thing that's uh, here, they are not exploring this, but I think for people who actually want to understand why, let's say, they might be a sus you know susceptible to uh, getting diabetes, they might not be aware of all these technical terms. So I think having an actual pre-trained language model that's, you know, solid as Llama 2 is uh, today would be really neat to kind of see whether people do ask these clarifying questions and can the model both clarify questions about this domain in general, while also provide explanations for specific diagnoses the model itself is making. So it's kind of neat opportunity to have everything within a single system uh, possible. And then uh, I, I, I told you we should be tailoring these uh, explanations to, to uh, different you know, populations. And now if I in the, in the core of everything, we have uh, pre-trained large language models that can clarify questions that can, uh, you know, that we can call these different functions for that give us different types of explanations. And it also has the ability to phrase these uh, responses in different ways because we can tell it um, in, a, in the prompt, okay, uh, you are going to, you are conversing with an AI expert and, and then they can, um, instead of those templates that we use to make responses, we can actually have the model generate while of course testing for hallucination but it can then go about tailoring uh, these explanations. And um, while we have talked to model, we and next time we are going to read another paper that does conversational explainability, this is extremely under, underexplored. So this paper is published last year and about the time that ChatGPT was released. So there is just a little, a uh, little work uh, in this space. So if, if you are excited, you can definitely make a nice contributions here. Um, last month, this was extended to, uh, excuse me, to NLP tasks. So if you go to this website, 
um, you can actually you do have a library for um, doing this for actual tasks that have unstructured data. I mentioned that these are more complicated, but now that challenge is uh, is is done uh, basically. So a lot of low hanging fruits. Some of them are getting more attention. Um, if you want to contribute to the space, you have you have ways to do it, which is good. Okay, any questions about that? Like how Llama 2 or ChatGPT may be used in this uh, these days? Any other limitations that, that you see with this approach? Yeah, I think when we have images, that might be a little bit more complicated um, as well, because then you need to have a system that also, when we execute this parse, it should work on images, and we have image image parts as our explanations. So how do you retrieve that conversationally? Like for me, if I am explaining something about the image, I'm pointing to him, like I'm talking and gesturing about parts that I'm talking to, but here a little bit constrained, right? Because you have um, textual outputs while working with image patches. And it almost seems like a um, better way to provide the response here is by having a voice like thing where there is a generic voice saying, okay, you should be looking at this part of the image and blah, 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 blah. Um, so yeah, I think that if we move to the more vision spaces, uh, then then this all becomes a little bit more involved as well. So again, lot, lots of challenges in this in this space. Yep. So uh, there is there are some things that uh, they they are really yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know uh, the details of any of those words uh, as well. Yeah, so we, let's say, um, let's say you have a specific expert, like, let's say you want to do something. Want to verify the thing, and then you mm -hmm. instead of like the asking a model directly, like the ask a model search for Google and mm -hmm. analyze the, the result from the few other problems, like, like the, explain their reasons to you. Something. Gotcha. So just bringing it back to the to the explainability here a tool would be your actual you know python code base for explaining the model Gotcha. Yeah, th this is an interesting point. Yeah, I will I will get these. I know what the exact work you're talking about and I didn't read it. Uh, and then I'll share the reference with uh, everyone else. Yeah, that's a that's a good point as well. Okay, uh, so let's see how, how this works, or at least how it worked last year. So they recruited 46 uh, healthcare workers and 15 grad students, and they asked them to answer on a scale from one to seven, how uh, easy it was to use this um, uh, interface uh, compared to some other dashboard inter interface. I don't know exactly what this dashboard is, but um, it doesn't have the ability to for you to query something, and then it gives you information with respect to that query. You are you just have ability to click on things and find your way, basically. And I don't think there are any like proper explanations involved there. Um, they also ask them to self-report their confidence, their speed, and uh, likeliness uh, to use uh, in the future. Um, and here are their results. Basically, um, 
on in this column you have healthcare workers in the um in the second column you have grad students and this is the they are reporting the percentage uh of people who agree that their system is better than that dashboard so higher value here is better for the um uh, for for their system and i mean the, all of these numbers are pretty high with a much higher rate they are they they enjoy uh engaging with their system um and i think the grad students and the workers exhibit some uh, differences. For example, we can see that grad students were much less likely to use it in the in the future. Maybe I suppose because they don't really need it, you know, um, not because the system itself was bad uh, in that sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know what was the purpose to use it in, in you know even evaluating with the grad students. Um, they also um, made them answer some knowledge probing questions after they have engaged with the systems to see whether after they have engaged with the system, their system, they can answer these questions better. Um, and um, again, compared to um, compared to that dashboard, the uh, for example, the accuracy and completed questions for talk to model is much. Uh, much higher for both of the groups examined, and the rate of could not determine, meaning they can't really answer, uh, is lower for the talk to the model. So these are the these are some good signs for this uh, for this system. Of course, um, again, it's not. Um, this would be um, an example of human grounded evaluation where we did ask people whether you know um, they can do something better with this system, but we, it's not really what they are going to end up doing uh, with these systems. So these healthcare workers, they are going to do use this diagnosis to, for example, make final predictions. So here, again, much better measurements, much more appropriate would be measurements of reliance and complementary team performance. So although there are positive signs here, I think there is still much more to be explored in this uh, space to know how good these uh, conversational ways of explainability are for the actual purposes uh, of explainability, which is basically, I can say this about every single work uh, we have covered in this course that more application grounded evaluations are uh, needed. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is this uh, pointer to the to the code base where you have um, you can actually apply to this to unstructured NLP tasks if you would like that. Um, are there any questions about any any of this conversational stuff? Okay, um, and then we'll stop here.